class act and a class A professional. So, thank you, John. If you can do an hour, that would be great. Great. Okay. Um, I'm lucky to be here because there's nothing that I like more than doing this. I, I teach at the uh, Eagleton Institute of Politics and do the Masters and PhD seminar. And, and when I do that, it reminds me why I do all this other record stuff. Um, as a matter of, I mean, John said he shared with you my background. Um, I've been doing this media stuff most of my life. I've also been doing public policy stuff most of my life. I started. Um, Sort of raised in, in politics and in, in uh, after I graduated from Lehigh University up in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania with a degree in economics and a degree in English, I, uh, I thought I wanted to go into communications business, so I got a job at a cable TV company. My job was climbing telephone poles, which meant I got right to the top of communications <laughs> on the very first day. And, um, I did that for a while and thought, you know, what am I doing with my degree and, and uh, what am I going to do with my life because the idea of climbing telephone poles in the middle of the winter, <coughs> actually climbing telephone poles is really cool. You got these things on your feet and you just like, this is before the days of cherry pickers, those boom trucks, and you went up digging these things in the pole and you got up to the top and all the kids in the neighborhood thought you were really cool and they'd stand underneath and go, oh, dear God, don't let me drop a wrench. And, and it was a lot of fun at, at, at 21 years old, 22 years old. Um, but I wanted to put my, uh, my degree to work. I wanted to put my skills as a writer to work. Um, I was in some advanced programs at Lehigh and, and had some sort of flattering moments for my writing skills. But I got a job working uh, for the New Jersey Association of Realtors trade association that represents people in the real estate business. I was the editor of their magazine. I was the editor, reporter, and writer of their uh, weekly newspaper, which was a broadsheet 16-page newspaper, which meant I had to really hone my writing skills. If you think about it, it, for those of you who are planning to go into public relations business or the uh, journalism and any sort of offshoot of journalism, learning how to write and learning how to organize your thoughts, learning how to make it interesting is the best skill that you can have. And even if it's a BS assignment of writing about how many closings took place last week, real estate closings, you learn to write that boring stuff in a way, in a way that is truthful, direct, and interesting. Every time you do that, you're honing your skills until that big moment comes when you can finally apply it. So I did that for several years <coughs> and got asked to work on a political campaign here in New Brunswick for a guy who was a Democrat running for mayor uh, in a primary election. He was challenging the incumbent and they wanted me to do, to write all of this, the Dick Mulligan speeches and his position papers and you know, all of a sudden, I'm getting some money for this, and, and, and I didn't know much about municipal government, but I knew how to communicate, and it, all of a sudden, I liked it. I got positive feedback, and the guy won his election. There's nothing, nothing more rewarding than working on a winning campaign, because you know that it all happened because you did it. <laughs> and, uh, and I went back, uh, worked on a gubernatorial campaign, doing the same thing for a guy who was a Republican running for governor in 1977, who had a, took a 16-point lead and turned it into a uh, probably 8 or 10-point defeat. It was not easy, but we did everything we could. I got, just got flushed. That was also a great learning experience. Even It's rewarding to work on a winning campaign, but you work on a losing campaign and you realize how you blew it. Work on a winning campaign, you know, hey, I'm great, the candidate was great. You work on a losing campaign and you go, where did we screw up? We just, you know, worked 60, 70, 80 hour weeks for 12 or 15 weeks. And, you know, and, and it's the Wednesday, the second Wednesday, or the, the first, the first Wednesday after the first Wednesday in November, I think. 
and you're out of you're out of a job. You look and I go, how did we screw up? And part of the way I think that we screwed up was that our messaging was terrible, and I got to learn from that. Fast forward a couple of years later, I got asked to to go to the General Assembly and be uh, a part-time researcher, researching um, policy positions and legislation as it came through the assembly, and part-time communications guy. 37 members in the caucus, just the minority caucus, 37 members in the caucus. They've all got lots of needs. They're all very demanding. They've all been elected, so they all think very highly of themselves, but for a lot for the right reasons. And so it's really demanding. And all of a sudden, you're in a paragraph factory. For a friend of ours, Vince Wright, in a paragraph, you're just like pounding this stuff out, and you get real good, and you get real good at thinking about uh, about policies and what language works to explain the, that policy. How do you explain auto insurance rates? How do you explain health care? I mean, beyond the fact that you need health care insurance and it's expensive, how do you explain that stuff? Well, that's kind of what that experience gave me. So I did lots of that stuff. I, I, I ran a campaign for a guy who ran for Congress who won, defeated an 11-term incumbent, and we went, went down to Washington with him, came back and opened up a lobbying business. It became the most successful lobbying business in the state. And part of the reason that I think we were successful was that we married sort of a communications angle to the good old-fashioned knowing the politics and knowing the policy and knowing the players that do this stuff. Did lots and lots of campaigns, did some campaigns in Eastern Europe, some campaigns across the country. <coughs> and uh, in uh, 1994, I ran the campaign against uh, Christy Whitman, who was running in a primary against the guy that I was working for, who was a friend of John's as well, who was running based on the idea of being the smartest guy that ever got elected governor. And, and, and as it turns out, he got to be the smartest guy who was never elected governor. Um, we threw everything but the kitchen sink at Christy Whitman. She was a woman from, some, from 100 and County. She was a former freeholder, former head of the Board of Public Utilities. Um, we threw everything we could at her, and she killed us. I immediately went over to, to Ukraine and started working on a campaign there. I didn't want to be anywhere they spoke English. As embarrassed as I was. I came back in, in uh, and in November of that year, Christy would have been one. She defeated, um, she's the first person to defeat an incumbent governor in New Jersey at, at a general election. And to my surprise, and, and uh, I got a call from her not long, or actually from her brother, not long after the campaign asking me if I wanted to join the administration in the Treasury. And this is a long story, it's going to get to my first big point. Um, I work in the Treasury. That's it. I mean, here I was, I was this generalist. I knew everything about everything. And your executive director, you got to, which is what I grew up to be in the assembly, every issue comes across your desk, you the Treasury. Well, they asked me to go there because they wanted me to help sell her uh, budget program and her tax cut program. She had run on a platform of, of wanting to cut the income tax 30%, and she was going to keep it. And so my mission was to sell the, bu sell the tax cuts and sell the budgets that would make them possible. Well, if you're going to cut revenues, there's going to be some pain. And so we had to develop full-blown... I think of them as political campaigns, but you guys are in public relations class here. There is no difference between a public relations campaign and a political campaign. It's all about convincing some big number of people, whether it's the public generally, whether it's 120 members of the legislature, or whoever the publics are that you're going to work for as public relations people to, to get them, make the market bigger for you. Did that. The budget's kind of in it, and the Treasury's an interesting place, because everything of state government has to get paid for. And so when you work in the Treasury, you learn your stuff. And that's my number one rule. You've got to know more than the reporter who's sitting across the table from you. This isn't about how cute you are. It's not about how clever you are. It isn't about having the, the, the funniest comment, and by the way, 
I pride myself in funny comments, and he's a, just as much of a wise guy. And it's kind of a little a thing in the in the political communications game. We know what can you get away with that's funny because it's just just sometimes it's like watching paint dry. Um, but being successful is about knowing your stuff, being smarter than the reporter who's sitting across the table from you. Uh, I'm going to run through a um, a handout. You don't need to take notes. But I'm going to give you this at the end of the class, and there's nothing, there's very little that I'm going to say except for when I ad lib. You don't need to take notes. You can pay attention. Copy. You can pay attention. I'm, but I'm not going to give it out to you, or else you'll read and you'll get ahead of me. So I said the most important thing is to know your stuff. The most important rule of doing an interview, because you're all going to be up here being interviewed by your classmates. Anybody want to guess what the number one rule of doing an interview is? Yes. Listen. Listen. Just wait. Sorry. Are you talking about the reporter or the? No, I'm talking about the the, the subject of the interview, the um, person who's who's being interviewed. Learn to stop talking. Well, that's a good one. <laughs> that's a good one. I'm going to get to that because that's a real good little sneaky reporter trick. Anybody want to guess? Rule number one in an interview is tell the truth. You get caught not telling the truth and everything else in the interview goes to hell. You have no more credibility. Rule number two is tell the truth. And rule number three is see rules number one and two. Now that doesn't mean that you have to tell all the truth. It doesn't mean you have to bear your soul, but do not ever lie. Another thing in, in, in interviews is to try to not be creative. Not try to not make stuff up. Try to not, uh, you know, you know your stuff. Remember, I said that's real important. You're the smartest person in the room on this subject. Let your knowledge carry itself. Don't think, oh, I got a clever thing I could say now. Or don't add the, oh, and by the way, I'll give you an example of that. Chrissy Whitman, again, to go back to her, this is before I worked for her. She, uh, she hired a guy on her campaign who had a little bit of a checkered past. He had, he had helped produce the infamous Willie Horton campaign, I don't know, a, a commercial. I don't know if you know what that was, but it was a, a commercial uh, during the Bush, during the 1988 campaign. It was racially charged. Willie Horton was a, a guy up in Massachusetts who was a murderer, rapist, or something like that. He got paroled from, from prison, sort of a, 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 an early release program, and then went out and murdered more people. And, and he was a black guy, and they got him going through a turnstile. And it was, it was a, 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 a commercial that lacked sensitivity at a minimum. Um, and, and it was done by a campaign and so So this guy comes to work for her, and, um, and, and within a day, every reporter knew that, that he had worked he had some connection to this commercial. And, and, and before that day ended, he had been terminated from the campaign. And like, oh, OK. Did the right, she found out about it. They did the right thing. Then when she was asked a question about it, she said, yeah, Larry McCarthy's, his name, Larry McCarthy's um, values weren't the same as our values. And so we let him go. And then in the breaking the don't be creative rule, she said, you have to understand, he was working for Roger Ailes at the time. Roger Ailes is the uh, president or chairman chairman of Fox News. He's an extremely conservative, extremely controversial person. And the problem with that statement was Larry McCarthy didn't work for Roger Ailes at the time. Roger Ailes had nothing to do with that commercial, although it's commonly thought that he did. He wasn't even a part of it. So. In just a throwaway line where she's being creative, she said, you know, I want to get rid of the guy. He didn't speak to our values. Perfect, good. Goes to your rule. Know when to stop talking? That was the place to stop talking. But she got creative and showed how much she knew about politics and said, you know, and he was working for Roger Ailes. Well, Roger Ailes, so Roger Ailes then sends her a, a, a you know, letter bomb, and it says, you know, you better, uh, I didn't, I'm offended by that. I wasn't connected to that. I demand an apology. So we now got a one-day story. She hired this guy that she let go. 
Now we've got a second day story because Roger Ailes, media maven that he is, has sent her a letter saying, liar, take it back. And then the next day, she has to apologize for it. So, but because she was being creative, because she just wanted a little more to say, she turned a one-day story into a three-day negative story. So, don't be creative. Another thing about an interview is try to avoid surprises. Okay, so a reporter calls you out. What's your name? Kajori. Kajori? Yeah. <laughs> like the easy name. Kajori, I want to talk to you about, uh, my name's uh, John Submergent, and I'm a reporter for the, the Westchester Widgie, and I want to talk to you about whatever it is. Uh, would you mind talking to me? Well, your answer to that is, I'd be happy to talk to you, but can I get back to you? Because in a way to avoid surprises, you might want to call the rest of the people in your office and say, has anybody spoken to this guy? Does he have an angle? You might want to look at his clips and see, what's this guy submerging written about widgies? You find out, well, he's real good and he knows his stuff, or he doesn't know squat. And the guy is really uneducated. I'm going to have to, in this, in this uh, interview, really educate him. And if you can call the rest of your people in your organization or send word out in your organization to say, what have you said to this guy? Then your comments, when this guy calls you up, can be consistent with other people's comments. In avoiding surprises. Um, Controversy tells sell stories. I'll give you an example. The, the, um, a reporter might call the New Jersey Department of Education and say, "How much money are you going to invest in? How much money are you going to spend this year on K to 12 education?" And the spokesman at the Department of Education might say, oh, "We're spending about uh, ten and a half billion dollars." Okay. The next day, that reporter might bump into somebody from the governor's office and say, Hey, Pete, man, what are you guys spending on urban education, or on K-12 education? Do you know what the number is? I go, oh, I don't know, I think 10, about $10 billion. Next thing you know, we got a story. Governor's office says K-12 education slashed by half a billion dollars. Right, because education said 10 and a half, and I said 10 because I was just, you know, I don't know, about $10 billion. Well, if I had called up education and said, hey, what, what number are you guys using? We were both saying essentially the same thing in our own minds. We were being inconsistent. And that controversy sells stories. It's important to be prepared. That was the first thing I started with. It's also important to use direct terms. And this is real important for you college-age guys. Be real direct in your answers. Don't start an answer with the word so. They do it in academia all the time. So, and then you start so, so let me see. Um, Governor, what are you going to do about the economy? Here's the wrong answer. Here's the indirect answer. What are you going to do about the economy? Well, you know, investment is off. We don't have a lot of investment anymore. People don't seem to have a lot of money to spend as consumers. And, and what, what I, the way I see it is that if we can reduce the amount of tax money, taxes that we take from people, they'll have more money in their pocket to spend, and then they'll invest that money spending at local small businesses and you know small businesses are the places that employ most people. And so um, by giving them back some of their tax money, the money will, will trickle down into the economy and it will create more jobs. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut the income tax 30%. Okay. That's, that, that answer is completely backwards. It's a big, dizzy dean windup leading into the answer. The answer is what are you going to do about the economy is I'm going to cut the income tax 30% because if we do that, people will have more money to spend, they'll invest it in their local economies, they'll invest it in small businesses, 
and they'll hire more people, and people will go back to work. Yeah. Just want to say he is right on. You'll see in a number of your last assignments, you'll see a note that you bury the lead. Yeah. Right. And I, I circled it, moved it up. This is right what it right, right what Pete's talking about here. Get to the point. Think of, think about yeah. answering questions, putting the what before the why. Because as I do that big dizzy dean wind up about all this trickle down stuff and cutting taxes and all that, if the reporter's sitting there listening to it, one, they're trying desperately, especially for you youngsters, they're trying real hard to follow the logic here. And they may disagree with the logic. And, at the, and by the time you finally get to the lead, the what, the what you're going to do is cut the taxes 30%. In the reporter's head, they're already having a fight with you. They're already having an argument. They're already saying, I'm not buying that bullshit. And so your point doesn't get made. When a reporter asks you a question, a negative question, and okay, the classic one, and I'm going to just do it because it's easy, is, John, when did you stop beating your wife? It's a negative question. Positive, the, 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 the answer, I never beat my wife, turns into, what's the story that comes out of that? Submergent denies beating wife. Or to a politician, um, yeah, Hillary Clinton, I don't know if you, anybody saw the debate on Saturday night. But there's a whole lot of focus on whether she was a puppet of Wall Street, whether she takes too much money from Wall Street. And if she said, I am no puppet of Wall Street, you know, so the, you know are, are, are you a puppet of Wall Street? You've taken gazillion billion dollars from Wall Street as a United States Senator and now as Canada President. How can you be independent? If she were to say, I am no puppet of Wall Street, she's repeated the negative. The headline the next day would, Clinton denies being puppet of Wall Street. And John, the question to John, it would be, Samurgen denies beating his wife. It's a negative question. You repeated the negative. If a negative question is asked, you rephrase it and you state the positive. To John's question, did you stop beating your wife? My wife, have a, my wife and I have a loving relationship and always have. To Hillary Clinton, I've accepted money from Wall Street and just like I've accepted money from small business owners across the country because I know that both Wall Street and Main Street are at the heart of the American economy. Don't repeat the negative. Um, there are no bad questions from a reporter. Okay, you have a lot of people. You have clients in the future, God willing. You listen to to politicians, you listen to you listen to the Republican debate, and they talk about how the mainstream media is out to get them, the liberals and the media. Or you talk to you talk to Democrats, and they'll tell you how how oh, that bastard from Fox News asked me that question. We have a final project uh, um, defending Trump's immigration. Okay, <laughs> um, entertaining comment. There are no bad. Questions. There are only bad answers in an interview setting. You've agreed to do the interview. There are no bad questions. So a reporter asks you a question about something that's off the point. You know, and this is a, this is a perfectly, um, perfectly professional questions. But you want to make you go into an interview. The only reason to do an interview is to get your points across. So you get up to do the interview, you're up at the podium, you ought to know the three things that you want to say. You ought to know the three things you want to get back to. Uh, an interview is a lot like a dance. Old-fashioned dance, anyhow. And, and it's a question of who's leading. Who's taking this interview to where you want it to go to make your points? And the tax cut questions from before. Well, Governor Whitman, you're, you're Christy Whitman, she wasn't governor at the time. 
your net worth is is tens of millions of dollars, aren't your aren't your tax cuts going to disproportionately help you? The bigger question is, she would say, the bigger question is, are these tax cuts going to help get New Jersey's economy back on track and create jobs for all these college students who are coming out with with tens of millions of tens of thousands of dollars in debt? The bigger point is, some people might say that, but you know what's important to me? Well, I'm not sure I agree with your premise, but here's what I think. Those are called bridging phrases. This, you know, and then it's like, the real issue is, well, it's important not to forget, in addition to that, a whole handful of them, you can make them up, there's, there's uh, half a dozen of them in the handout I'm going to give you. It's a real good tool to move the interview to your points. Because when the interview is off on somebody else's points, you're losing. You're winning when you're making those three simple points that you want to make. You should never do an interview unless you know what those points are that you want to make. But you can do an interview because it's cool to be in the New York Times. How about it's cool to be in the New York Times and they're out and you're for being a white beater? That's not cool, but it's cool to be in the New York Times if you're making your three points. The three points about your product, your service, your clients' issues. Um, it's important in interviews to be friendly, but professional. I, I would venture to say that, that a great number of John's closest friends and my closest friends are reporters. Best man in my wedding, godfather to one of my children, AP Bureau Chief. He just had... Uh, had breakfast the other day with a, with a former reporter. These are all really good friends, and it's good to make friends with them. But this is a professional exchange. A journalist has one job and one job only, to gather facts so that they can be presented in a meaningful way to expose the truth or to tell the truth or express the truth, probably a better way, to the readers. They have an obligation to the readers to be thorough and responsible. You have an obligation to your clients as the flack, as the, the press person, as the maybe you're going to be the, the chair of, of your company. You have, a, you have an obligation to, to the company or the client to be as truthful as you can so that readers are not misled. Don't get fooled into thinking just because it's my good buddy Jim that he's not gonna, he's gonna cut me a break. He may cut me a break because I've always been fast and responsive and responsible, and may round some corners a couple times when they say, you know, I think you missed this or that. He may respect me because of my credibility, but it is a professional relationship. So here's some dumb things reporters do. So let us have these funny little skinny notebooks. Long. Who's big? So they can write one hand with, without having to turn the page or write across the page. The report will say, uh, Mr. McDonough, you want to explain that? And then I'm here talking, and the reporter's going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This nodding of the head thing, that doesn't mean the reporter agrees with it. That uh, the nodding of the head thing means, oh, I'm getting it. It's so funny, people leave interviews and they think they did great. She, re she agreed with me the whole time. Now, that nodding thing is just to keep you talking. Mm -hmm. And so you ask you questions, and you, back to your question, which was your, your first point early on. Know when to stop talking. Uh, the great old reporter trick is to say, uh, John, how did Rutgers play on Saturday? Give me an answer, John. This is over. John, how did Rutgers play on Saturday? Disappointing. Okay, so he said disappointing and he stopped. The little silly reporter trick is to say, how'd they do? Say, Waiting for it. Oh, they got out coached. He says disappointing. And then I'm the reporter and I raise my eyebrows, I look at him and I tilt my head like a dog hearing a whistle. 
he gets nervous with the silence. Yep. And starts talking. Oh, they got out coached, you know. And when when they uh, when the fans started bo uh, booing Kyle Flood, well, I I knew that they were getting out coached, and I knew that the even the crowd was turning against them. And I'd be surprised if this guy lasts the whole season. Holy smokes! He just went from disappointed, which was the point he wanted to make. He fell for the stupid reporter trick. Got uncomfortable with his own silence. Felt a need to fill every possible instant with some clever John Smurgeon thing. And the next thing we got out of this is, <clears throat> Rutgers official says Flood not likely to make it through the season. Says booing by the fans convinced him Flood's on his way out. To your point, when you're done answering your question, shut up. They can't write, they can't report what you don't say. So when you make your point, be done with it. Um, off the record comments. Did you guys get into this? <coughs> yeah, okay. There's a lot of there's a lot of times when um, people will do an interview and they'll say something. And go, oh, that was off the record, right? That was off the record. Nope. It wasn't off the record unless you said you wanted to go off the record before you started saying it. And when you were done, you said, let's go back on the record. Okay, so off the record, and this is a lot of grades off the record, not for attribution, and blah, basically off the record. You go off the record when the reporter needs to know something to complete his or her knowledge and write a better story. <clears throat> but they don't seem to be getting it. And you don't want to be quoted in this. But you want to fill their knowledge out. Remember, you're you're the subject of the interview. You're a source. Everything is quotable. So you want if you when you go off the record, you say, "I want to go off the record if you don't mind, because you don't seem to understand this, and I don't want to be quoted, but I want to help your understanding." And so you can talk then, and you say, "Okay, now I want to go back on the record," and the reporter will acknowledge, "Okay, we're going back on the record now." So the reporter can be taking notes. A reporter can be tape recording you when you're off the record. It doesn't matter. That's just a, a note-taking situation. The rule of journalism is off the record means off the record. Now, it's a scary place to go if you don't know what you're talking about. And I rarely would suggest that a client go off the record because that's for professionals. That's for him. That's for me to do. That's for people who have long-time relationships with reporters. So the operating principle here is they can't write what you don't say. So don't think going off the record is a good idea. I know in, in the governor's office, they say bright young things that come to work for us a year out of journalism school or something like that. And it's back in those days, we used to get a pile of clips, maybe 150 pages long. And without fail, somebody would start, and within a week, they'd be in my office. be holding the clip. They'd be all nervous and sweaty. And they said, I thought I was off the record. And I would laugh at them, because they all, because everybody goes through it. I've, I've been burned more times. I get calluses from that. And yeah. every time they get burned, but you keep your sense of humor yeah, about it. Me every lunch. Um, I talked about getting to the point. If you're doing a broadcast interview, you have to get to the point in like three seconds, five seconds, eight seconds. You got to get to the point right away. Just think about what it's like when you're watching TV to the degree that any of you still watch TV. I understand you're all cable cutters here, but you might be cable cutters here. TV needs to be interesting. And if you're doing that Dizzy Dean wind up thing, it's not interesting, and the viewer will change the subject. Person asks you a question on TV, boom, you got to hit it right away. TV is a hot medium. Do television, remember they're pretty much shooting you from here up. You want to get to the point, you want to be enthusiastic, you want to be as crisp as you possibly can. If you're doing an, an interview and you're, okay, so you're sitting at your desk. Become a big CEO 
political boss, subject of an interview, and there's a knock at the door, and in walks the reporter and her cameraman. And her cameraman probably looks like Zonker from the Dune Spirits commercial. Throw back in the 60s. He's got this big old thing on his big camera here. Maybe he's got an earphone in. And he's coming here, and he's looking down at you. And she's standing there going, Mr. Submergent, where does he look? Anybody want to guess where John ought to be looking? Yeah, the reporter. Anybody think differently? Good for you. At the reporter the whole time. TV, think about what you're seeing on TV. You're seeing a, you're seeing a conversation go on. And, and the, you know, a lot of people will look at the camera. Look at the cameraman thinking they can help him some way. And it just looks like deer in the headlights. Or they look at the camera. That's right, right? Yep. They look at the camera and then back at the reporter and the camera and the reporter. And, and, and the next thing you know, they're all shifty-eyed and they look real nervous. Sitting in a chair. Watch this on Sunday morning, pro Sunday morning programs. People who sit on the chairs, they lean forward. Their backs are never against the chair. They're leaning forward. Why? Because if you lean forward in a TV interview, you sort of break a plane. You're, 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 in, you're in the frame that way. And if you're sitting back, and you're a guy, this thing, even if, you know, I'm not particularly overweight, but even the, even the slightest amount of being overweight, if you lean back, this thing comes out. And if you're a woman of a certain age, and none of you are, and you're leaning back, you got all this turkey stuff going. Lean forward. You can see it on the Sunday programs. The anchors are all leaning forward, whether it's George Stephanopoulos or any of those people, they're leaning forward. Katie Kirk, they're all leaning forward because it just it engages them. It's a great trick to learn. Um, other thing you want to do in an interview is turn off your phone. Hope it's Barchi. Um, I just turned it off. Think about what you wear on TV. Think about you, know, you got this wardrobe. You got that nice jewelry thing. Forget the nice jewelry thing. Plain is great on TV. You got that snappy suit. Forget it. Think about Brian Williams. Lester Holt. Handsome, very attractive men. Their clothes are very, very plain. Brian Williams is the ultimate in plain. Um, Charlie Rose is the same way. They wear plain blue suits, they wear a plain suit, they wear a tie that, that contrasts with the shirt. It's none of this, like, you know, tone on tone stuff like Regis wears, those guys. It, that really hip, trendy thing he got. Looks terrible on TV. Um, and if you're a woman, losing the jewelry, losing plaids, losing loud, lose loud if you're going to be on TV. Um, if you're offered makeup, I know a lot of you young ladies have had your fathers tell you how adorable you are and side over here. Some of you had your mothers telling you how handsome you are. You're going to go to TV, some of you. About all of you. Um, you're going to go into a TV studio and they're going to say, Do you want some makeup? And you know, you're a macho kind of guy. You go, I don't need just stinking makeup. And the lady might say, oh, I do my own. Forget it. TV is about looking good. And those people who run TV want nothing other than the image to look good. And so they're going to put makeup on you that you never thought you needed. They're going to put stuff up here. John and I both had hair in the front here years of when we first knew each other. They're going to make it not shine. They're going to make you look good. Put your hands, put your fate in the hands of professionals. Now, I say they're professionals, but they do make mistakes. They make lots of mistakes. Go to that, that Roger Ailes, Larry McCarthy, Christy Whitney thing that I said earlier. One of the reasons why... Roger Ailes is so insistent on demanding corrections and apologies is because very early on people started reporting that the Larry, uh, that the uh, 
and Willie Horton ad was a Roger Ailes production. And that was killing his reputation. And it keeps getting repeated. Look in this internet world. I mean, you guys get your news from reckless blogs all the time. From blogs that, that don't have, <clears throat> uh, maybe, that don't have a, a, a newspaper associated with them or don't have anyone who's got some skin in the game who's got a reputation that's important to protect. And they're liable to say things, and then next thing you know, that blog gets repeated and gets repeated and gets repeated, and all of a sudden, you know, the lie has become the conventional wisdom. So when there's a mistake, the thing to do is to pick up the phone and call the reporter and say, hey, John, I know we had a good interview, but, you know, you attributed something to me that I think that I didn't say, maybe you misheard me, or maybe you attributed it to the wrong person, but, um, but uh, that I never said that. Could you write a correction? Or could you issue a clarification? Because that correction or that clarification will be appended to the story, and then other reporters, when they're looking to, to do some research, they'll see the clarification. It's incredibly important in the public relations world, especially public relations, because you guys are going to be representing some of, you know, you're going to have clients who are like amorphous corporations and, and, and um, and, and their commercial value is directly related to um, the confidence that people have in their products. And this little thing here, little mistake there, you know, that you know, maybe the EPA find your company five thousand dollars for uh, five thousand dollars for a uh, you know inappropriate waste disposal or something something that was um, unintentional put the recycling in the garbage bin, put the garbage in the recycling bin, whatever. EPA comes in and issues you and gives you a $5,000 fine, right? Five, oh, 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 dot, oh, oh. And let's say a little Mr. Speedy reporter is sitting at his computer and he's got the phone in and he's typing and he forgets the decimal point. Now all of a sudden it's it's a $50,000 fine? Move my decimal one. So EPA cites, 500? EPA cites Submergent and Company, fine Submergent and Company $500,000 in environmental fine. Well, half a million dollars is real money. And when the, news, when the story is in the newspaper and then is in the archive, and people are looking to say, what kind of company am I going to invest in? And they get submerging in company, and they see they got a half a million dollar fine for trash in the environment. I'm not invested in that company. I called up the paper and said, uh, hey, rookie reporter, you lost a silly little decimal point. It was a $5,000 fine, and it was inadvertent. That clarifies that. Really important. And, and reporters, by the way, they don't like to do, um, they don't like to do corrections, but their job is to, is to um, inform their readers. And if you tell a reporter, I think you've misinformed your readers. That's, the card, that's a cardinal sin in journalism. No matter how strongly you feel as a reporter that it should be this or that, your job is to inform the public. And so they'll issue a correction. And if they want to issue a correction, and this isn't a matter of your opinion versus theirs, then you call the reporter's editor. And you go all the way up the newspaper. If you're right on the facts, the correction will be made. If you're just mad, it probably won't. But if you're right on the facts, it will be. So think about your messages. When you're doing your press conference, you know, get to the point right away. It's also important to try to figure a way to make what you're going to say Real. So think about. Can we just stop for one sec? Just because it, you kind of finished your thing on television. Now, for you, 
you know, this may be right. As, as television is going to a different place, well, everybody who is doing a video presentation is putting it on their YouTube channel. They're streaming it on their website. So this, you know, this obtains right for all of that. Absolutely. You know, the next iterations of, okay, well, maybe NBC isn't coming to interview me, but I'm XYZ. You know, on Cheerios, <coughs> we've got a gluten-free product. I'm, I bet there's something on on a YouTube channel with them getting their message out, right? So it's the same yeah, and principle and it, for and these it, different outlets. And there's so much of this, you know, Skyping stuff. You know, you'll, you'll see um, news organizations that can't afford it. NJN, and New Jersey yeah. Network, whatever it's called, New Jersey News, is uh, they can't afford to have reporters out there anymore. So people agree to go on, and they go on on Skype. And you all know how bad you look on Skype, you know, when you got the thing there and you're looking down, and, you know, you really got to think about what does this image look like. The, the trick to doing a Skype interview, if you're going to actually do one, is is to mount mount the the laptop or your computer up high, so you're looking up into it, you're looking directly at it, not down at it, and to block out what you look like. Drop out that little window yourself, because you'll look at yourself. You want to look right at that. Now, earlier on, we did the thing about where do you look, and Mr. Billy's in the back there, I got it right. Um, the one time you do want to look directly at the camera is when you're doing a remote. And that's kind of like if you're doing a Skype thing or doing one of these things that may turn into a YouTube video. When you look at that camera, like that one right there, and you look right into its eyes, and and you just, you propose to that camera. You don't ever take your eyes off and have a little ear thing in your ear going in, there'll be some producer shouting stuff in your ear and it won't make any sense. And of course the thing will fall out and you'll try to look cool and stick it back in. But you just look right into that and you don't ever waver from looking right at that camera. It's a, it's a, it's a trick, I mean it's a skill, and, and once you've got it, uh, you're golden. Now remember the audience. This handout that I'm going to give you was written for, for people at the Environmental Protection Agency in Washington. They're all scientists. They're all smart people. Brilliant people. They let their brilliance get in the way of their answers. Uh, EPA scientists talk in terms of how many parts per billion are we going to have of nitrous oxide, nitrogen oxide, and sulfur dioxide in the air we breathe. Environmentalists are saying, stuff's going to kill you. Babies are going to die based on this proposal. And the scientist is going, well, our, you know, we've done a, a study group of over 27 million people, and we found that at 50 parts per billion, rip, 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 rip. Okay, the scientist is being a whole lot more responsible. But the environmentalist from Greenpeace is being a whole, a much better communicator saying, that regulation is going to kill people. So remember, try to remember your audience and talk in people terms. If you're using phrases that your grandmother wouldn't understand, just stop. There's no way of driving that boat around and getting back to the point. Just stop. Just stop, 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 stop. You don't get any points for being clever or, ooh, look at it, smoothly going around. Just stop talking and start over and say, you know, let me try to rephrase that. Stuff's going to kill people. Get right back into it. Um, it's also important sometimes to talk in terms of values. Health is a value. Now that, that EPA thing that I just did, that was all full of numbers. I'm going to tell you, 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 you when, I, when I worked at the EPA, the Bush administration was reauthorizing the Clean Air Act. The Clean Air Act is a pretty big deal. So it gets reauthorized in every 20 years or so. And, uh, and here's, what the, here's what the EPA was proposing to be the lead. And you guys know what leads are. Lead in their, in their press release. The EPA today announced a, a plan to reduce by 70% nitrogen oxide, sulfur dioxide, and mercury in our air. The program, known as Clear Skies, will eliminate in excess of 35 million more tons of those pollutants than would be eliminated under the current Clean Air Act. Okay, that's 
factual, they're going to reduce these three things, nitrogen oxide, I don't know what that is, sulfur dioxide, yeah, that's the smelly stuff like eggs, and mercury, yeah, mercury I know is dangerous because I know that's a poison, but I don't really know it. They're going to reduce by 70%. Well, how much is up there? 35, they're going to take 35 million more tons of those, how, tons of this stuff in the air? It doesn't make sense. It's perfectly accurate. If you were going to do an answer in value, in, that was values laden, how about this? The EPA today announced a plan designed to address cases of chronic respiratory illnesses in children, the elderly, and other vulnerable Americans by vastly reducing the levels of three dangerous pollutants in the air we breathe at a rate far greater than under current law. First one was data-driven. This is the same answer. The first one is entirely data-driven. Second one is entirely values-driven. Think about why the things you're saying are important. In an interview, the point isn't to impress people. The point is to impress points. Impress points on people. Impress values. You don't use the big word, because I wonder what they're saying. Some big words. I know some SAT words. Mm -mm. Don't use SAT words. Use words that he'd understand. Use, uh, <laughs> uh, repetition. Don't be afraid in your press conferences to repeat yourself, you don't, you're not getting style points. Nobody ever wrote a story that said, President, Bo President Obama yesterday held a press conference at the, at the, in the Rose Garden, and he was really cool. And he looked, he had a great suit on, and he was clever. And, and man, am I glad he's my president. No, they write a lead that says, President Obama today said, boom, boom, boom. He might have been cool. He might have had a snappy suit on. He might have been elegantly dressed, and he might have used words that were just, I, I love the guy. I love, I love his style stuff. None of it is the point. You're not getting graded on being clever. You're not getting graded on being cute. You're not being graded on a little magic tricks you can do or the way you entertain people, which is really my downfall because I can think of myself as an entertainer. You're getting your points for getting your points across. Um, I don't know. You got any questions? What can I? That's pretty much that's what's in this handout for, for interviews, and again, I'm going to give it out. How can I help you? What can I? Anybody want to tell me about their their project and find some way that I might? Okay, who are the uh, who are the primary presenters? Have you figured that out yet? For your, your have the teams figured that out yet? Who's who's whose role is going to be at the at the podium dealing with it? None of you. No. None of the teams have figured that out yet. Okay, good. So you're all fair play. So what's the so yeah. so what do you present? What do you present? All right, Rose, tell them about your project. Okay. Um, our project is going to be handling a crisis in Whole Foods Corporation, you know, the grocery stores for really healthy people, and we're going to <laughs> the crisis is a contamination of chicken found in salads that was produced by a Whole Foods brand, and we're going to yeah, that's our crisis. Okay, <laughs> that's great. There's a there's a a template for how you deal. I hope I'm not no, going to spoil anything. There's a, there's a template for how you deal with environmental or health crises. And it starts with saying, one, I understand your concern. You want to make the audience, you want to make, you, the audience is your consumers. The media is the way you're going to reach your consumers. This isn't about talking to the reporter, it's about talking. It's about what the reporter writes. So the first thing you want to do is acknowledge the concern by people. The second thing you want to do is tell them, tell them what you've done to date. The third thing you want to do is tell them what you're going to do in the future. And the fourth thing you want to do is tell them, this is not for the messaging, but tell the reporters when you're going to get back to them. Go right back to it. I, I feel your pain, I understand your problem, I feel your concern. Here's what we've done, here's what we're going to do, and here's where we're going to get back to you. So you got 
bad chicken salad. You know, Whole Foods is always concerned with the quality of the products that we produce and we understand the concern that, that shoppers across the Northeast have about our chicken salad. You should know that we have immediately pulled any chicken salad, regardless of which planet was made in, we've pulled it off the shelves and we're testing it to better understand if there are any ongoing issues the best thing, uh, the, the, the testing is going to continue for the next two weeks, and during that time, Mama Rose's chicken salad will no longer be available, and consumers might want to, can, and consumers can bring back their containers for a full refund and a voucher for Papa John's chicken salad, and we're going to keep you updated at all times. That's that template. I understand your problems. You know, so, you know, would, it wouldn't at all be, look at the Volkswagen. Did you talk about the Volkswagen crisis? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah. the first thing Volkswagen, so there's this crisis, right? Volkswagen is trusted German engineers. We know they're the best engineers in the world, right? Big manufacturers, they really know this stuff. And it's Europe, so they're all about the environment. And it's all that stuff. They got a brand here. And they're cheating. And the, they're cheating on the environmental test. And the first thing they did was deny it. Oh, it only happened in a few cars. Oh, it was never our intention to. The smarter thing they could have done was say, we're looking into the problem and we understand everyone's concerned because no one wants to breathe dirty air. Validate, validate people's problems. So you got, you got a crisis. Um, in, in more of a, do you have a, do you have an environmental disaster crisis? You got a fire crisis going on here anywhere? We have a uh, consequences of a Category Five hurricane crisis. Okay, so you got a, you got a crisis like that. You know, you put on your fuzzy vest, right? You put on some weight and a fuzzy vest, and then you do Chris Christie, and you get up, and that first thing you say is, I understand. And I share the concerns. I understand what a frightening, awful situation this is for everyone. And then he goes back to this template. So this is validating, validating the, the concerns of your audience, and you win the audience over. And then you say, we've got 5,000 trucks going around, and they're clearing out sewer drains, and they're making sure all this flood water goes away, and we've got teams deployed in 562 municipalities across New Jersey and they've got 800 numbers and they're working around the clock and we're going to continue to do this stuff for the foreseeable future and we're going to be having three updates a day at, at 8 a.m. at noon and at 4 p.m. Okay, why are you doing that? What's that update thing about? That's the, the how often, how are we going to get back to In a crisis situation, um, now a shooting would even be a better, better example of this. You go through this, and then, but if you're, if you're the government or you're, the, you're the, the agency in charge, you're the cool head here, what you want to do is you want to set up a media center so that all these reporters are working in one place. And you want to tell them, I'm going to get back to you in two hours or three hours or four hours, some regular schedule. That way the reporters aren't saying, oh shit, where am I going to go to the next information from? I better go, let me go down the street and ask these people. And the next thing you know, you got reporters running all over town and they're shopping around and, and they don't know. All they, they, all they need to do is get, I've got John from Montgomery says, I was here and shooting long after the police said it was over. I heard shots. Right. Well, John from Montgomery... That's going to be going on in Paris today. Exactly. Um, and I don't know if you guys remember the... Uh, there were these <coughs> shooting... No, you wouldn't. There were these shootings around the Beltway, uh, the Beltway in Washington. There was a sniper. Beltway is like 395. It's the road to 495. Mm -hmm. Surface around Washington. 
and, 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 and there, there was a sniper there, and I don't know how many people they shot, but they shot a lot of people, and it was freaking everybody out, duh. And, and the sheriff of Montgomery County, it was either Montgomery or Prince George's County, became a media star. The guy had two or three press conferences a day, and he would do these updates even if he had nothing to say. He's managing the crisis. Because the worst crisis he can have is lots of people saying what they think they might have heard because they know somebody who knows somebody who is absolutely certain that that thing might have happened that one day once. Holy smokes, in, in the communications crisis business, you can't keep up with that stuff. So you try to, and this is sort of a little bit cynical, you try to manage the media by, you know, I set up a media room here, I set up a tent, and I got wire, wireless, and I got outlets, and I got printers. That means all these reporters are going to come back and work in my space. And if I'm in charge of managing the crisis, I'm going to be accessible to them at all, at all times. So when, when tricky question dances through John's head, he can say, Hey, Pete, I'm hearing this stuff or that stuff. One, I can answer it right away. And Pete, I can make a little mental note. Boy, we're starting to lose this. There's an awful lot of rumors coming up out of North Plainfield that Route 22 has been closed. And so I can find that out and I can address it. It's part of that two-way street that goes on in the PR. And business. so what, what's happening, what's happening out there in the media world at 8, 12, and 5? Live news broadcasts are going on, and from those live news broadcasts, you go on you, Yahoo, you go on Xfinity or whatever, you log <laughs> in there. The news things are links to those broadcasts right. of a of a big you, thing. You, you and so the you, either you're providing the news, or they're getting it from. Yeah, that's a, that's a, an important thing to know about TV. <laughs> you got a news hole, as it's called, at eight o'clock. You got a news hole at noon. You got a news hole at five or six, whatever time the local news on, and you got a news hole at 11. Now, <clears throat> with um, print, print reporters, although now print is, is so online driven, it, its deadlines have changed. Print reporters, let's just, let's assume there's not a lot of internet anymore, and print reporters have a deadline of six, seven, eight o'clock at night, their story needs to be filed. And if they don't have a story, if if some questions come up, if some unanswered questions rear their head, if there's a new angle, and the story doesn't get written, well, the newspaper is just a little skinnier that day. Or they put some stupid dog trick stories, or human interest stories, or, and here's a new recipe for pumpkin pie stuff in. But with TV, they got to fill that news hole. And if they're not going to you for the story, they're going to someone else. And a way you can manipulate them, think about where the news is, uh, TV stations, for the most part, with the exception of News 12 and stuff like that. Real, let's see, real TV is in Philadelphia where it's in New York City. So if they're going to come out to New Jersey to do a story, they're going to dedicate a whole lot of time to drive to Trenton and all the way back. And people could be getting murdered. Houses could be burning, bombs could be going off, pedestrians could get hit by buses, all sorts of competing stuff in New York. That, you're, you're, you're asking them to invest a lot of their time and resources to come down to this thing. As John had, had, had breakfast with a mutual friend of ours who worked for Frank Lautenberg. Frank Lautenberg was a senator from New Jersey twice. And, and Frank Lautenberg would go and well, would turn around. Chrissy Whitman would go and say she's going to spend three billion more dollars on, on K-12 education and we'd have 20 print reporters and three cameras in the room. Frank Lautenberg would go and announce that uh, there were going to be improvements made to baggage handling at Newark Airport and the guy would have 10 cameras there. Or if you ever watch the weekend news, you'll always see uh, Senator Schumer from New York standing in front of a bank that's from Tomato. Well, yeah, it started this. standing in front of a bank right. saying, you know, we're doing something and it's important, whatever it is. I mean, thin stuff. But what are they doing? They're, they're doing things 
close to New York so that TV stations can get there, get it done, and get mm -hmm. back. And if you time it right, you can be guaranteed you do it at, at 10 o'clock in the morning. That's enough time for the reporter to get there, to file the story, and get it in for the, for the afternoon news, for the, the noontime news. You think about those deadlines. You can, part of being a public relations pro is knowing um, what the media cycle, what the news cycle is about, and what the broader timing is. You know, what's going on in the world. Um, you want to break bad news? Four o'clock Friday afternoon, state of New Jersey today announced an insurance rate hike. Nobody reads the papers on Saturdays. Reporters want to get out of town on Friday afternoon. Um, bad news gets broken on Friday afternoons. Good news? Good news gets broken on Sundays. How do you do that? You call up the reporter and you go, I'm going to give you an exclusive. Let's start talking about this on Thursday. I'll give you an exclusive. I guarantee you on Monday morning we're going to go public with this. You give that reporter a couple of days to write this. And, and you know, maybe you work out a deal. You say, I'll give you the exclusive, but you can't call anybody other than us in the governor's office. You can only call the governor's office. You can only talk to us. We will walk you through every aspect of this important story. We'll work in every aspect of this policy, and you'll get to break the news, because that's the ultimate star in the far ahead, to be the first. To be the first and the most accurate. First is, is the most important thing it, for, for most journalists. So you work out this deal, the reporter writes it on Sunday, it's on the front page of the Star Ledger, and the next day, every, every newspaper in New Jersey is following that story. It's a great way to, I mean, you're doing crisis stuff, which you don't, you won't have much uh, control over, but, you know, go to, go to your bad chicken salad story. So you do this thing, you're handling the crisis, you get a minute to think about it, you go, man, maybe we ought to try to reshape the image of Whole Foods. You know, it's not just about high prices, it's about high standards. Um, and, and you know, a thing that you could do would be to find a feature food reporter and say to, to him or her, we'd like to take you on a tour of a chicken salad factory and not only show you what we have done, what, what we do, but show you why we're making it better. And, and, and you, you, know, you can bring cameras in, you can do the whole thing, we'll let you talk to anybody. Next thing you know, you've built a feature story that follows your crisis by, you know, okay, what should Volkswagen do? Volkswagen, maybe in a year, after they get all this stuff sorted out with the regulators and all the fines they're going to pay, maybe bring a bunch of, a handful of, of um, environmental reporters through their plant to show, look at us, we're a you know, zero waste plant, we don't throw anything out, and we've done all these other things to try to polish up the image, the, the Volkswagen image, and, and address the crisis that lingers in people's minds. Because, you know, what do you know, what do you know about Volkswagen? You don't know about the Beetle, you don't know about all those, how your parents used to hang out in the Volkswagen bus. You don't know all the super funny stuff about the Volkswagen grandparents. Sorry. <laughs> what you know is they cheat on air pollution. And, and so that's going to linger for a long, long time. And so these, these crises don't go away. One more quick one before we let you go and we take okay. our break. We've got Andrew. Philly's guy? Philly's guy. Yeah, they, they, they've taken on an interesting one. It's a little bit different than what we've been talking about. Uh, we're taking on Trump's topic on uh, illegal immigration and his comments and statements that he said about it. And how they're on reshape it into a real conversation about immigration and get away from the... How should he... How, how right, Trump should right be there? there? Yes. And that this... Could potentially, we could finally have this conversation. 
Well, there's no explaining what's going to help. And, uh, he's dug himself a hole. <coughs> Maybe. He certainly has dug himself a hole with the media. And let's assume that he really wants to correct this. I'm, I'm not convinced of that, but, but I'm not convinced otherwise. He's dug himself a hole. The first thing he wants to do is let go of the damn shovel. And I'll take a look at what he's doing. You know, some of my best gardeners are Mexicans or whatever the hell he said. And that, Stop with that. And think about that bridging phrase. And those bridging phrases I talked about, the bigger point, Let's get off that message. You know, think, think about that. You know, if you were doing an interview and they say, but Mr. Trump, you said Mexicans are drug lords, rapists, robbers, and, and all criminals. What he wants to say is the bigger point that I was trying to make, and maybe I was inarticulate at that time, is we've had some problems with immigration, we need to fix immigration, we're a country of immigrants, and I want to talk about a complete and thorough program to recognize that we are a country of immigrants and also understand, and also recognize that our current system needs to be fixed. And now let me talk about my solution. He's owning it then, <clears throat> as opposed to owning the stupid things that he said because he's the Don. It's, it's really, it gets back to that dance thing about who's leading the conversation. Now, part of the, part of the way you, uh, you want to deal with that is you want to have a whole lot of credibility. And you're walking up and you're saying, you know, America's got a problem with immigration. We have a system that's not working for anyone. It's not working for people who have, it's not working for children of, of undocumented alien, uh, undocumented persons, whatever the right word is. Not working for those children who were raised in America and can't get aid to go to college. It's not working for small business owners who find that um, there's a, 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 uh, an economy operating in the shadows. And it's not working for, um, Big city mayors who have tens of thousands, if tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people putting demands on public services for which appropriate taxes are paid. And so what I want to do is talk about a comprehensive program, and here's what it is. And then as reporters fire and say, yeah, but you said all Mexicans were rapists. Here today to talk about a comprehensive program that helps this nation recognize its history as a nation of immigrants, that acknowledges the strength we have that comes from our diversity, and chart out a path that works for everyone. It takes some discipline. And, and, and in that case, I mean, there's just, you know, constantly lobbing grenades. Yeah, but you said they were drug lords, too. Or you said, yeah, you know, there are lots of Mexicans who like you. Name one. You know, he's just, he's, he's, you know, it, it's that whole thing he wants. He, the, the way to get through that is to go up to 30,000 feet, not down to, to two. Because if you're down at two feet, if you're down at the ground level, you're getting tangled up. You're talking about, you're talking about some stupid thing you said once. And the bigger issue is, how is this country going to maintain, going to draw on its strength as a country of immigrants, and how are we, but how are we going to make sure that the American value of fairness works not only for undocumented people, but for documented immigrants, I don't know, there's a, a right way to say that, and for the hardworking Americans who are all our neighbors, because this is about our neighborhoods. Our neighborhoods of Jose, Maria, Mary, and Wally. Neighborhoods that are made up, that are made stronger by all that. And here's my program. 
Thank you. Thanks for listening.